Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2017-2018 Lectures in Catholic Experience. I want to extend a special welcome to any of you who may be here at St. Jerome's University for the first time. We're very happy that you could be with us this evening. And I want to begin tonight by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. The university is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. My name is Christina Venin. I am the Associate Dean here at St. Jerome's University and I coordinate this lecture series. This evening's lecture is the Higgins Lecture on Religion and the Media, a lecture created to honor one of our past presidents, Dr. Michael Higgins. And for the first time, I think Michael said of this lecture, I'm very well uh, happy to be able to welcome Michael and his wife, Christina, who are with us this evening. And we're great to have them here. <laughs> so before we get started with the lecture itself, would you please make sure that whatever electronic devices you have with you are powered down, shut off, whatever the right term is today, I don't know, please. Thank you. Two days ago, Pope Francis issued this year's message for World Communications Day, and he entitled that message, The Truth Will Set You Free, Fake News and Journalism for Peace. In the message, the Pope says, in today's fast-changing world of communications and digital systems, we are witnessing the spread of what has come to be known as fake news. This calls for reflection. And so after some reflection on the nature of fake news, Pope Francis suggests that the most radical antidote to the virus of falsehood is purification by truth. And in Christianity, he says, truth is not just a conceptual reality that regards how we judge things, it is not just bringing to light things that are concealed. Instead, truth involves our whole life. Truth is something you lean on so as not to fall. In this relationship sense, the only truly reliable and trustworthy one, the one on whom we can count, is the living God. He goes on to say the best antidotes to falsehoods are not strategies, but people. So if responsibility is the answer to the spread of fake news, then a weighty responsibility rests on the shoulders of those whose job it is to provide information, namely journalists, what he calls the protectors of news. In today's world, theirs is, in every sense, not just a job, it is a mission. Pope Francis wants to promote a journalism of peace, created by people, for people, a journalism that is at the service of all, especially those, and he says they are the majority in our world, those who have no voice. This message provokes the question, what exactly has been the effect of Pope Francis's consistent message to promote mercy, peace, goodness, truth, and a culture of encounter in our world? This evening, we are very fortunate to have Austin Ivory with us to talk about the impact of Pope Francis on the media's perceptions of the papacy and of the Catholic Church. Dr. Ivory is a British writer, journalist, commentator on Catholic and political affairs. He is founder and coordinator of Catholic Voices, a project now in more than 20 countries worldwide, and he is contributing editor of Crux, the U.S. news site founded by John Allen. He holds a Doctor of Philosophy in History and Politics from Oxford University. He is author of the book, The Great Reformer, Francis and the Making of a Radical Pope, widely regarded as a benchmark Pope Francis biography. It draws from Dr. Arbery's deep background doctoral research on the church in Argentina. He is currently at work on a successor volume covering Francis's pontificate. 
Dr. Ivory is also author of the best-selling book, How to Defend the Faith Without Raising Your Voice, subtitled Civil Responses to Catholic Hot-Button Issues. Between 2000 and 2004, Dr. Ivory was editor of the Catholic weekly, The Tablet, after which he worked as public affairs director for the late Archbishop of Westminster, Cardinal Cormac Murphy O'Connor. He went on to be director of a London-based immigration campaign called Strangers into Citizens, based on Catholic social teaching. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Austin Ivory to speak to us on the topic, Communicating the Church in the Age of Francis. <clears throat> Very much. I think you can hear me with just this microphone. Yes. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm with you at the end of something of an odyssey which began in Chile and Peru uh, 10 days ago and has brought me from Santiago to Lima via Dallas and now finally here Toronto. I go back to the UK uh, tomorrow. So I'm not quite sure where I am, but I do know, I do know it's a very nice place. I've had a lovely welcome here. You're a delightful crowd. This is a great university, and it's a real pleasure to be here and an honor to be giving a lecture uh, named after the man uh, who is, in fact, here tonight, Michael Higgins, who I understand isn't generally at these events, so I take that uh, as, a, as a great honor. Thank you, uh, Michael, and it's great to meet you, finally, at last, having heard so much about you. Um, my friends, the title I gave Christina, when, when people ask you to give talks a long time ahead, you hedge your bets. So you give a nice general title. Mine is Communicating the Church in the Age of Pope Francis, which I thought would give me plenty of latitude to talk about almost anything I wanted. And when I came to think about it, to prepare the talk, because I, as you can imagine, as somebody who is considered an interpreter of Pope Francis and also a professional communicator who's been an apologist and worked in church communications, I get asked to give this kind of talk a fair amount. And I normally try and home in on what I think are really three main areas. Now, I'm going to list those areas, and I'm going to say why they're important, and then I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to talk about them. <laughs> because I've decided you need something better tonight, something deeper. And I'm going to explain, having first laid them out, why I'm not going to talk about them and why I want to go deeper with you tonight. But if I, as I lay them out, you might find that you're interested in this. Most people are. They're interesting things. They're to do with Francis and communications and the media, the shifts, the changes. And in the Q&A afterwards, because I won't be speaking forever, uh, we'll have hopefully a good time for Q&A. And that's the point where we can address some of this stuff. Okay? So let me just lay out the three. And then as I'm talking, you might be thinking about what is it that interests you, what you'd like me to go into more depth in with. The first is what we might call Francis in the media, that general topic, the extraordinary media appeal of Pope Francis, the way he moves out beyond the boundaries of the church. He's often as we know, better received outside the church than within it, which I think was a similar experience to 2,000 years ago. He has an extraordinary capacity to touch hearts. We all think of great moments, the washing of the feet, the kissing of the man with neurofibromatosis, which deeply move people who actually pretend to be or claim to be not Christian. There was a wonderful moment just now in Peru, in Ciudad Trujillo, which is quite an old city with narrow streets, and the Pope was going down with his Pope mobile the streets were absolutely packed. And there was a very small woman, old woman, hunched down like this with a sign above her head, which some people held up for her. And it said, my name is Soledad. I'm 99 years old. I cannot see. I want to touch your little hand. Humanita. Francis somehow sees this, stops the Pope mobile, gets down, gives her the most warm embrace, strokes her face. Extraordinary moment. It's gone viral all over the place. It is moments like that which we can all think of. Why is it that the Pope does that kind of thing and what is that rooted? And then there's the Pope as the prolific communicator, the spontaneous communicator, the man who does these extraordinary airborne press conferences, direct, unfiltered. Many Catholics absolutely hate it. There are no spokespeople involved here. Rambling, anecdotal, colloquial, pastoral. This is a whole new form of papal communication. Powerful metaphors, sometimes very offensive ones, parables. Cardinal Durham likes to tell the story shortly after Francis was elected that down on Madison Avenue, where the big ad agencies are, so amazed were they by the change in the image of the church as a result of Pope Francis that they said to Cardinal Durham, 
who is it? Which is the agency? Who's got the job? <laughs> and Cardinal Denham would say, eh, it's not an agency, it's just him. But where is that coming from? What is the strategy, in a sense? Is there a communications strategy? And then there's the, uh, the catechism of the gestures, which I've talked about, those extraordinary ways in which the image now of the Pope, the images rather, the pictures, the gestures have become as important as the words. So that's one story. Let's call that Francis in the media. And then there's a second story, which is a little bit duller, but it's the institutional story, how the Vatican's own communications is responding to the challenge of this new Pope, not now not so new, about to finish five years in March. We keep thinking of him as new. And how this, there is an institutional adjustment or failure to adjust to this new form of papal communication. Just a few facts which you may not know. There is a new secretariat for communication, a new body in the Vatican, which is now taking charge of uh, merging all the different, slightly chaotic, different kind of Vatican media uh, under a new head called Monsignor Diario Vigano. There's a new team at the press office. There's an American spokesman for the Vatican. His number two is a woman for the first time, so the assistant press director. It's a much more international place. The press operation has expanded. Journalists in Rome say that uh, outside war zones, the Vatican is the only boom town in journalism in the world at the moment. It is fascinating. I've been covering the Vatican for many years. I think there are probably now 50, 55 full-time Vaticanisti who work in Rome uh, 30 years, 20 years ago, that it would have been, I don't know, 10 or 15. Most of them would have been Italian, most of them ex-seminarians, most of them men. Now they're much younger, there are more women. It's a very, very interesting transition. Um, then there's the third challenge, the third story, the third area, which is the one actually Christina just mentioned, alluded to with this new message that the Pope has done. One of many messages he's given on the state of journalism and the state of communications uh, at the moment. This is what we might call the challenge of the new media environment. How Francis, how the Vatican are responding to what we all know to be in the age of Trump and Brexit, a highly polarized, uh, highly tribal new media environment in which people quickly take up stances. We all have to have an instant opinion. We all have to declare war on the people that share, have a different opinion. And of course, news has increasingly become instrumentalized and used in the service of ideologies, of politics, or in the case of Breitbart News and Trump, the purpose of information is simply to create an outrageous response. How do we as Catholics respond to this? I gave a talk recently in London called How to Create a Culture of Encounter in an Era of Fake News, uh, knowing that the Pope was going to be talking about this. How in an environment driven by rapidity and impact with that tendency to tribalization can we be, as Catholics, as Christians, the bridge? How can we create new consensuses within this environment? How do we stay free from falsehood? How do we build relationships? So on. So those are the three areas that I think represent significant transitions in this papacy. There's a lot of stuff to talk about in all three areas. And I hope you've made a note of them and you're thinking in the Q&A, you might want to come back to them. And now let me tell you why I'm not going to talk about them or why I'm not going to focus on them. Because when I was thinking about these three different topics, I began to feel bored and restless. Now, I'm a bit of an Ignatian. I like Ignatian spirituality. I like to listen to feelings that come up sometimes from nowhere. And um, being bored and restless is you know, not uncommon. But it's interesting that when I'm usually preparing a talk like this, I usually get quite engaged. And I found myself bored and restless because I've realized that these are not the real story. These reflect the deeper story. That actually this is the what. But what I'd like to address with you tonight, because you're a very special audience, is the why. What lies behind these changes? What's really going on? What is the story that we need to tell? See, the problem with writing a book like I wrote called The Great Reformer is that we tend to focus a lot on the man, in inevitably. He's a compelling and fascinating figure. But the danger is that we make out that he's a kind of superhero, that he's responsible for everything. Uh, and that somehow when he's not there, everything will go back to how it was, which is what a lot of people think. But actually, I want to argue tonight that there's a much bigger and much more interesting story to tell, that Jorge Mario Bergoglio is a protagonist in these changes. He is part of a change. But the change is much bigger than him. There's something broader going on here. There's what they call a change of era, and that's the phrase that he's used often and that they used particularly in a Parasida in 2007. 
See, the Francis pontificate is the fruit of, I think, the deepest, most thorough, most fascinating discernment of the signs of the times of anywhere in the world. And it took place in 2007, in May, in a parasida, a big shrine in Brazil, where the entire Latin American episcopate came together. It's called Selam. It came together for the first time since 1992. And the lead up to it was fascinating. They had conferences, they had papers, they really discussed this stuff. What is going on in the world and what should the church's place be in that? Nowhere else in the world were they doing this. They did it in Latin America. And Jorge Mario Bergoglio was, of course, then Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires, was a protagonist in a parasita. He was the head of the redact. He was, he was basically in charge of redacting the document, the team that produced the document that resulted. So that's a big part of the story. But the other part of the story is what one might call a crisis in the existing model, a crisis in what was going on in the universal church. The universal church in 2012 was still a European-centered church a rich world-centered church, and there was a big crisis. There was a big crisis in the model of evangelization. Now, I think this came to a fore, and if you've read The Great Reformer, you know I'll make, I make something of this, and in the next book, I want to make even more of it. There's a synod in 2012, which some of you may remember, which was called the Synod on the New Evangelization. New evangelization meaning how can we propose the gospel to societies exactly like your society and mine, where there's a Christian legacy we are talking about deeply secularized societies where lip service might be paid, but these are basically uh, irreligious societies. How can we repropose the gospel uh, in that context? Now, Benedict, I think, is in many ways the person, the Pope, who lays the groundwork for the Francis papacy. And I'm going to be arguing this a lot in the next book. And I think what happens is that Benedict sees that there's a problem. And this has been confirmed to me by Cardinal Well, who led that synod. Benedict saw that there was a problem, and he called the world's bishops together to discuss it. What was the problem? The problem was that secularism and relativism, change, social change, had happened so fast in so many of our countries. I mean, one thinks particularly of dramatic examples like Quebec and Ireland or Spain. The pace of change, the amount of hostility to the church, the secularism, the individualism, all the things that we're familiar with, had all happened so fast that the church was taken aback was thrown back on itself and took refuge in what one might call an ethicist, uh, a, a, an ethicist deviation. What I mean by that is that we, we took refuge in our comfort zone, which is truth and doctrine. In other words, faced with the threat to truth, we asserted truth. Faced with relativism, we asserted objectivity. Faced with, uh, faced with individualism, we asserted universality. But what happened was that we ended up as a church looking like an ideology. It was as if all we cared about was a series of ideas. Now, I, I speak here as somebody who was involved, particularly back in 2010 when Pope Benedict came to Britain, involved in many debates with secularists and humanists. And they would always say, you guys believe all these things, a series of moral proposition, sorry, a series of moral doctrines and a series of intellectual ideas. And I would say, well, actually, no, it's much more than that. It's different from that. But they'd say no. And so I came to see in so many of those debates that the church had come to be seen in our contemporary society as an idea, really. And not just an idea, but an institution that was only interested in itself, not interested in humanity. An institution that was distant, irrelevant, highly moralistic, but at the same time beset by scandals of finance and sex, which it would rather you didn't know about. This was a fatal combination for evangelization. I think Benedict spotted the problem. It's there in 2005 in Deus Caritas S, that beautiful document he produced. Being Christian, he said there, right at the beginning, being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but an encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. I'm going to read it again. Being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new direction and a decisive, a new horizon and a decisive direction. Now, really interestingly, that gets quoted right at the beginning of the Aparecida document in 2007, and it reappears where? In 2013, in Evangelii Gaudium, where Pope Francis says he never tires of repeating it. Here we have a clue to the crisis that I'm talking about. 
So Benedict saw that the church had overcomplicated its message, that it had become too intellectual, too focused on the idea, that it had to get back to what theologians call the kerygma, which is the, the, the news, the good news of God's salvific love. But above all, the, good, the, the news that God is love, that God is mercy, that we have been saved, that he is there, that he comes out to meet us. The essential primary Christian proclamation, the kerygma, that somehow had got lost, that at the heart of our faith, is a person, the encounter with the person of Christ and the experience of that encounter, which then transforms not only our lives, but the whole of society. That's the heart of the thing that got lost. And Benedict was warning at the same time that the structures on which the church was depending in law and in culture were being swept away, that the church had to now learn to move outside those structures. Benedict saw all this, and that's why he called the synod. I'm not sure that Benedict actually knew how to move the church on, but he saw the problem. Because at the, heart of, uh, at the heart of this, when Catholicism is reduced to really a set of ideas, an ethical proposition, often in the service of cultural battles, particularly in a certain country to the south of here, there's something wrong. We're being defined by modernity. Either There's two errors with modernity. We can either be assimilated to modernity, that's not good, or we end up in an angry rejection of modernity, that's not good either. There's a failure to carry the polarity of being in the world but not of the world. See, Christianity, Catholicism, at its most creative, holds these things together. And in the creative holding together of those polarities, allows the Holy Spirit to create something new. In other words, Catholicism at its greatest generates culture. It isn't either reacting against it or being assimilated to it. So in a way, there was something badly wrong in the rich world church. Arguably, you can say after the council, the church became, had assimilated too much. There was then a rejection of that uh, in, this, in this conservative reaction. But this was very obvious in the 2012 synod that there was something wrong. There was a, a constant call in that synod by many cardinals, uh, a calling for a kind of doubling down of the previous program. What's the previous program? Affirmation of orthodoxy, of doctrine. You know, double down on that. But at the same time, blaming the culture for the church not evangelizing. You heard this a lot in the 2012 Synod. Long speeches about relativism and secularism and persecution. I remember the Spanish Cardinal in Madrid saying, this is just like the 1930s when they were, you know, persecuting the church. Uh, but there was another voice in that synod, and it was very, very different. And it was the voice from the developing world in general, but from Latin America in particular, which was actually a very different kind of a voice, a voice of what we might call consolation in Ignatian terms. Joyful, optimistic, missionary, pastoral, warm. And the difference in those voices, I was there reporting on it, was really very, very striking. Of course, I wasn't aware at the time of just how deep the crisis was. It was very obvious something was going on there. That in the rich world, the church was in death, that we had got things out of balance. I'll give you another example of a polarity, universality and particularity. Jesus was at the same time universal and particular. He, he, he was God. He upheld universal truth. But he was also incredibly attentive to the person in front of him and their concrete situation. How can you be both universal and particular at the same time? Well, that's the whole point. Christ can be. We have to be both those things. Global and local would be another example. Truth and mercy. We had got very good at truth, but we had lost sight of mercy. So there was an imbalance in the church, and that's what came through at that, uh, at that synod. Now, I'm not sure that the synod really resolved anything. As you know, uh, it was very swiftly followed by some very dramatic events. Benedict XVI announced he was going to resign. There was, a, there was a conclave, and from that conclave emerged the first ever Latin American. So here's my point. Francis arrives with a program already conceived, with pre, uh, pre, uh, uh, like one of those you know, uh, uh, computers you buy with the, with, the, with the software already loaded. He doesn't come up with all this from nowhere. This is a program that he brings with him from Aparecida. Because at Aparecida in 2007, five years earlier, the bishops had done, as I said earlier, a great job of discerning the current age. And they had called for something called, they called a pastoral and missionary conversion to meet the challenges of the age. 
So here we have the great notes of the Francis Pontificate, particularly in Evangelii Gaudium, that what was needed was something kerygmatic about focusing on the encounter with Christ, something pneumatological, something open to the Holy Spirit, pastoral because it, it's close to people in their concrete circumstances, missionary because it's about going out rather than, rather than staying behind. In other words, we have here a strategy not for resistance, but for renaissance. And at the heart of a parasita, at the heart of what that document sees, is a world which is badly in need of closeness and concreteness. Bergoglio had been saying this at least since 1997, when, as an auxiliary bishop, he spoke at the Synod on the Americas about the disenchantment of the contemporary world. Faced with a lack of hope, he said, what they saw was a lack of hope in the world. The Lord is moved, comes down, and gets close. We must rediscover his way of being in order to evangelize, his way of coming near. The key word, he said, is proximity. Encounter, conversion, communion, and solidarity are the categories that express the proximity. See, at the heart of our faith is the news of a God who comes close, who comes alongside us, who is incarnate in a concrete circumstances, in a family, in the here, in the now, in time, and in space. So that in embodying who Christ is, the church then evangelizes. That's how you evangelize. But the source of the renewal in others, we have a crisis in the church's proclamation. We have a crisis in the model of evangelization. And we have a source of renewal in a new paradigm forged in Latin America, in a parasita, which is the fruit of this deep discernment of modernity. And it's here that, Evangelia, that uh, Aparecida used the phrase, already used by Bergoglio, of a change of era. This isn't just an era of change, but a change of era. There is a, a shift, a paradigm shift. And what we have in Aparecida, which appears again in Evangelii Gaudium and is very strong in Laudato Si, is an analysis of globalization, of modernity. Call it postmodernity, technocracy, all the things that we're now living with. A very, very deep discernment. The, the realization that our lives are increasingly being shaped by powerful, anonymous, depersonalized, and dehumanizing forces that at least in their negative effects, and of course this isn't about being against technology, but in their negative effects, disempowers humanity, erodes cultural diversity, in fact, erodes culture, undermines the family, dissolves the bonds of belonging. It's harder and harder to belong in this world. So despite generating unprecedented levels of wealth and technical development, which we're all familiar with and I'm sure m most of us have benefited from, uh, we've had actually an era marked by the greatest socioeconomic inequality in history. So this is a change of era uh, that was analyzed by Parasita as causing pervasive discontent everywhere spreading new social and political turbulence. I'm from the nation of Brexit. Down south is the nation of Trump. You don't need to be told about social and political turbulence. We have also the rise of a culture that is distant from and are frequently hostile to Christian tradition. This isn't just pluralism. This is an active hostility to the legacy of religion and culture everywhere. <clears throat> so a parasita in this context poses a challenge to the church that basically says you have to now you as a church, we have to recover the bonds of belonging. We have to build family and culture. They're not going to be protected by the law. They're not going to be protected by culture anymore. And the forces of international technocratic globalization are dissolving them. Who is going to build them if not the church? Family and culture and a mission specifically to go out to those marginalized from both church and society and the economy to rebuild a new society, a culture, from below, from the crucified, uh, from which would follow the reinvigoration of the church. So the, the task here was to concentrate above all on accompanying and educating Catholics, and obviously other people, but helping them above all to have this personal encounter with Jesus Christ, to have a life of prayer, and to help them live the very gospel uh, to which we were calling. In other words, it was no longer enough simply to stand outside all this, wag our fingers, rehearse the merits of Christianity and declare that the whole world was in error and we would wait for them to wake up. And when they did wake up, we would receive them with open arms. That was no longer going to work. We had to go out and rebuild from below. And nor could we rely anymore on structures and power alliances 
that kept the church distant from ordinary people. So the, the, the call in a parasita was for the church to take a clear stand with those crucified by the new global economy. So that means understanding also the church's understanding of the poor, not just materially poor, but spiritually poor, those suffering from, the, if you like, the existential isolation, the consequences uh, of modernity. So this theme, after a parasita, 2007, appears very strongly in Bergoglio's own speeches and his own writings. Uh, he talks about, uh, uh, he says, a, a, a year after uh, a parasita, he says that uh, the church is called to a deep and profound rethinking of its mission. What's required is confirming, renewing, and revitalizing the newness of the gospel rooted in our history out of a personal and community encounter with Jesus Christ that raises up disciples and missionaries. So as you see here, the, the, the future that would be expressed in Evangelii Gaudium. Now, interestingly, they predict in a parasida, and Bergoglio says this regularly, that it just won't be enough in the future to follow rules, to stick to prohibitions, uh, to have partial adherence to the truths of the faith, occasional participation in some sacraments, all that will go. What we'll be left with is something much, much necessarily, if you like, much smaller, much more uh, committed. So what is this change of era? Because I really want you to understand this because it's crucial to understanding the big shift. What is this change of era? Well, if you've read Laudato Si, and I hope many of you have, it, it, the idea appears there very strong, at least it's implicit, because the book that's referenced in Laudato Si is by Romano Guardini in 1950, and it was called The End of the Modern World. It's a very, very extraordinary book where he predicts, he wrote this in 1950, he predicts a future of mass social destabilization, the erosion of institutions, mass migration of peoples, and the increasing power of depersonalized technocracy dominating our lives, hence this idea of the technocratic paradigm. All this is in 1950, and he even coins the term postmodernity. I tell you, it's quite a find. You should read it. It's really quite extraordinary. Uh, that he predicted a future in which, if you like, family, tribe, culture, all these would continue to liquefy. Now, this is very well described nowadays by the sociologists Zygmunt Bauman, many of you are familiar with his idea of the liquid society. None of this is new, but what's remarkable is that it's predicted by Bauman and it's really, really understood and dealt with uh, in the Parasida. What Guardini foresaw in 1950 is the now that we are living through. So how does this reading shape Francis's view of what the church has to do? Guardini, interestingly, in this book, it's a very grim book in many ways, and yet it's also very Joyful, because it foresees something else in the future. That as that modernity, the modern era, had sought to arrogate the church, had sought to retain Christian ethics, but in a kind of civic bourgeois moral system. But in the postmodern world, all that would be blown away. You know, if you like, the Christianity light would get, cultural Christianity would get blown away. In the new era, Guardini said, the unbeliever will emerge from the fogs of secularism. It's a great phrase and learn to live honestly without Christ uh, and faith. But the church, unshackled from law and culture, would be better able to contradict this technocratic culture uh, and could more easily present the gospel as a flare in the darkening sky. Now, the keynotes of this renewed Christianity, said Guardini, would be above all humility. See, the, great, the, the interplay would be between technocracy, which is all about power, which doesn't respect limits. And on the other hand, you have this renewed perigmatic Christianity, which is really offering Christ. It's, 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 a, it's a humility there, a, a Christianity of service, one that meets people in their concrete needs. So it's fascinating to see, if you like, the, 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 the interplay between these two, these two forces of our world. This is all what forms Francis and forms the Latin American uh, church. So what does it mean? How does the church respond to this liquidity? Well, you can see it in so much of what he says. For example, the Brazilian bishops in 2013, he talks about the, the loss of the experience of belonging, the subtle but relentless violence, the inner fragmentation and breakup of families, loneliness, abandonment. It's quite apocalyptic in a way. A lot of people think this pope is a kind of sunny, nice guy. <laughs> He's not. He has a deeply apocalyptic view. Because what he sees is the breakup of families, of loneliness, of the inability to love, to forgive, to understand, the way life becomes a hell, uh, the, 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 the inadequacy, the unhappiness, the addictions, all the things that we live with in our contemporary society. So what does the church have to do in those circumstances? 
Here is a pastor who really understands what people are going through. In his discernment, he sees God summoning the church to draw close to people in their anguish and in their loss, to warm hearts with mercy, to be a church that maternally gathers its people around the fire of Easter morning, as he told the bishops in Washington, D.C. He told the bishops then, be pastors close to people, pastors who are neighbors and servants. The church evangelizes, in other words, through concreteness and through closeness. Two of his most popular words, famous words that he often repeats in Italian, vicinanza and concretezza, in Spanish, cercanía and concretez. He's almost obsessed with those two words. Uh, why? Because this for him is the incarnation. At, this is how the incarnation is lived at this time. Today, he said, we need a church capable of walking at people's sides, of doing more than simply listening to them, a church which accompanies them on their journey which is willing to go into the dark night with them. That's what mercy is. Mercy isn't just standing outside. It's the willingness to enter into the suffering of others. So this is really the basis, is it not, of so many of Francis's uh, messages. And there's one other point that really I find very striking when I look back at the origins of this pontificate and the shift that's going on, is that they recognize there's also a big shift in post-modernity. See, before the fall of the Berlin Wall, one might say, that Western society cared about ideas. Right? The ideology was the main threat to Christianity. So what we have was a whole theology designed to respond to the attack on Christianity of liberalism and socialism and communism and all the other isms. But after the Berlin Wall, what happens? All that falls away. People no longer care about ideas. They only want to go shopping. We have a culture of consumerism and gratification and individualism. How does the church in that case, which has this wonderful edifice of ideas, yeah, that's also what's going on, isn't it, in 2012? Why isn't the message getting through? Because the church has all these beautiful ideas. We've endlessly reformulated the Catholic faith. We've got this fantastic catechism where it's all beautifully explained, but nobody's listening because they've stopped believing in ideas. I think Benedict actually was the last world leader who actually believed in reason, but yeah. So what's going on? So how does the church speak to a society which is really, what's behind gratification? What's behind consumerism? It's the search for something. Don Balthazar talked about the three transcendentals, truth, beauty, and goodness. The three things that, in a way, we're all looking for. And if you like, truth, truth is the ideas. Goodness is the morality. What's beauty in this case? Beauty is what captivates you. Beauty is what moves you, and you don't quite know why. It's not just what looks good. In, 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 in the Christian, if you like, view of, view, of, view of beauty, it's mercy. See, it's the mercy that captivates people. The story I told you earlier about the old woman, Soledad, holding up that sign. Some of you, I think, I, when I tell it, I've told it a couple of times recently, I, I, I want to cry. I do, I want to cry. It moves me. Why? That's mercy. So, you see, when they looked at this, they said, actually, the way you speak to contemporary society isn't through big ideas, and it certainly isn't through moral doctrines, because morality is something that people have to come to in their own time. They'll come to see it. But if you say you need to be good, but they don't know why, that's not going to appeal to them either. But mercy, yes, mercy speaks to people. Who embodies mercy? Who in history embodies mercy best? I would pick out two figures, a contemporary figure, Mother Teresa, a world icon, but also St. Francis of Assisi, right? It's like a transformed existence, a different way of being. St. Francis of Assisi embodies a connectedness with God, with creatures, with each other, which we recognize immediately and it delights us, it moves us. If I ask you, why do you like Francis of Assisi, you'll probably stumble to say why, but there's something that's captivated you. So this, I think, is absolutely key, that, that mercy is, has to be at the heart, then, of the way we speak uh, con to contemporary society. So this really forms the basis when we're talking about Francis and communication. This is why he is a different kind of pope, not just because of who he is, but because of the change that he thinks needs to take place in the church in order to evangelize contemporary society. At the heart of his message to the church is the need for what he calls pastoral conversion. Pastoral conversion is moving out of the security of the ethical temptation. And actually, 
doing stuff that matters to people who need it. And at the same time, not drawing any distinction between evangelization and charity. See, in Latin America, those things go together. In our country, sadly, they're apart. You know, in the Bishop's Conference, they have one department for evangelization where they're all slightly right wing. And then there's another department for charity where they're all slightly left wing and they don't really talk to each other. In Latin America, it's actually the same thing. They don't distinguish between the two. If you take away evangelization, then you create just an NGO. But if you have evangelization without charity, then you're not communicating who Christ is, which is close and who is close and concrete. So these things need to stay together, need to come together. He said, I think in one of his most stunning addresses uh, in his entire pontificate, uh, in February 2015, he was talking to the cardinals. And he said, there are two ways of thinking and of having faith. We can fear to lose the saved or we can want to save the lost. Even today, it happens that we stand at the crossroads of these two ways of thinking. The thinking of the doctors of the law, who would remove the danger by casting out the diseased person, and the thinking of God, who in his mercy embraces and attempts to reinstate him and turn evil into good, condemnation into salvation, and exclusions into proclamation. Very, very challenging. He's really saying, what do you care about? Do you care about actually saving people or do you care about safeguarding the institutional spaces, safeguarding, protecting the institution, defending the institution? It's very, very challenging. In September last year in Medellin, Colombia, he gave what I think is the second part of that homily where he said uh, that, the, that a lot of the precepts and prohibitions and commandments that the disciples who followed Jesus believed in the problem was it made them feel secure, that they believed that by fulfilling particular practices and rites, they were released from worrying about what pleased God. And Jesus tells his disciples that obedience meant following him and that on that path they would encounter lepers, paralytics, and sinners. And that these realities demanded far more than a formula or an established norm. So, Following Jesus is about, to some extent, yes, believing the right things. But actually, we have to also to be freed from being stuck in that because we're actually going to encounter concrete realities. It's a bit like when the Pope called the Synod on the Family. And he said, again, remember, in Philadelphia to the U.S. bishops, you know, it's not enough to keep telling people that the Catholic Church believes in the indissolubility of marriage. We have to help people actually live it. We have to show people how it's done. We have to, pers- you know, Get young people and say, commitment's a wonderful thing. Here's how you do it. Rather than simply as more and more people divorce and the church shrinks, we stand there fulminating. So this is a very, very different uh, shift. Now, just how do we move from here? And you're very familiar in Canada, as I am in Britain, with a church in desolation. Our churches are in desolation. Let's face it. We we, we feel besieged, beleaguered. We're depressed. (laughs) Let's face it. How do we move from here to there? How do we move from desolation into pastoral conversion? Well, there was a remarkable speech in Santiago de Chile, which he just did last week, with the Chilean church, which in many ways is like our churches uh, in desolation. Uh, It's a very different kind of church. And he gave a spiritual masterclass, I think, to that church. Uh, The Chilean church is overwhelmed, as you probably heard, with the scandal over Father Karadimas. They've had a huge abuse scandal, complete loss of credibility in public opinion. And the church has sort of turned in on itself. It's depressed and it's angry and it feels defensive and all the rest of it. Francis took the example of St. Peter in desolation after the crucifixion to show how Jesus' love seeks to prevent him turning inwards, obsessed with that failure and, and betrayal. By embracing its wounds and failures, the church is set free, he said, from trusting in itself, and making itself the center rather than Christ. A church with wounds can understand the wounds of today's world and make them her own, suffering with them said, in effect, charting a route for us, for all our churches, out of desolation into pastoral conversion, to pass from being a church of the unhappy and disheartened to a church that serves all those people who are unhappy and disheartened. That is the path of pastoral conversion. So pastoral conversion means reconnecting evangelization with charity. Charity linking charity with justice, no justice without denunciation, no evangelization without charity. This is the call. But above all, it's about learning to be close and concrete. 
to be direct, to be immediate, to be practical. So communicating the church in the age of Francis, and I'll, I'll sum up now, is simply a matter of embodying this call to be close and concrete. And that's why Francis does what he does, speaks the way he does, and what he's calling us to do as well. It's about mercy. Mercy is, he says, the credibility of our faith. We are not credible unless we embody mercy. And mercy is about being close and about being concrete. So let's go back over those three things. Francis in the media, the institutional reform in the Vatican, the challenge of the new media environment. They're all great topics which I hope we can talk about. But I really wanted to get across to you tonight something much bigger, the bigger story behind those changes, the big shift, the paradigm shift, the shift of pastoral conversion, the call to be close and concrete in a polarized, globalized world. Thank you very much. Okay, if we don't have something to talk about after that. So, uh, I know we're, I'm just going to ask you, because we do have two people with microphones in their hand, and it would really help all of us, first of all, to hear the questions, and for us to get them recorded, if you'd show some patience for them to get to you uh, with your questions, okay? And I'll let you, Austin, just uh, decide who you are. <clears throat> Thank you for that wonderful uh, presentation. I <clears throat> I read The Great Reformer when it first came out, and the most moving story in there is the relationship between uh, Reverend Tony Palmer, Pope Francis, and you didn't touch on ecumenism, but that is such a, you know, that with the, what he did with Waldesian Church in Italy and just the way he builds bridges consistently with those outside our tribe, and I'm a revert. I was an evangelical minister for 30 years and uh, came back to the fold. But that story, I wonder if you could just give a real quick summation of that, because it, it'd be a shame for a lot of the folks here not to hear just that relationship. You mean the Tony Palmer story? Yeah. Why, why don't you give it? Give me a break. You give it. No, no, I don't want to talk. I, 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 you, you tell it so well, especially around the Eucharist. Around the what? The Eucharist, how yeah. Tony was married to a Catholic. And how he ended up getting buried in a Catholic cemetery as a result. I don't want, I'm spoiling the story now. Can you tell it just a little bit? So Tony, Tony Palmer um, was, he died very tragically in between actually the writing of my book and its publication. He died uh, in a terrible motorcycle accident in Bristol uh, in England. He lived, in fact, in Bath. And uh, um, he, this motorcyclist was taken to the hospital in Bath and uh, the surgeons who were operating on him received a call from the Pope, which you can imagine surprised them a little bit. This guy, Tony Palmer, was, had become very close to Bergoglio when he was Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires. He was actually an Anglican bishop, but not in communion with the Church of England. It's complicated. But they had become very, very close, and Tony said that he regarded Francis as his spiritual father. And Francis said some, I mean, he, Tony told me some extraordinary things, which frankly, had he not died, I probably wouldn't have published because they were very, very intimate. But, you know, I felt that, you know, one of the things he said to them, because Tony felt very torn between, you know, he wanted to, he felt himself a Catholic. And, and Francis said to him, no, I want you to stay where you are. We need you as a bridge. So he, I think Francis is convinced that in this world of ecumenism and interreligious dialogue and the culture of encounter, we need bridge people, people who are willing to live on the frontier where people are willing to take risks. Because I think that's how he sees it. The Holy Spirit is there where you, can take, uh, where you can take risks. Yeah, so Tony was, in fact, buried as a Catholic, as he had always asked to be. Uh, and again, the Bishop, <laughs> bishop of, of Bath received a call from Francis saying, look, I want this uh, Anglican bishop to be buried as a Catholic. So you imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank He's you. a disconcerting Pope, huh? Thank you. That's not at all, not at all. Thank you for remembering that. Down, down here. Oh. I read an article in our local paper around Christmas time, and I don't know how true it was, 
but I'd like your comment that a group of bishops from Australia mm. were going to approach the Pope mm. and request that the vow of celibacy be optional and also that if pedophile priests or other people go to confession and confess that they molested a youth, that the confessor refused to give them absolution mm -hmm. unless they go and report their actions to the police. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like your comment on that and just how... So, so just to be clear, the, the, the second bit you've just told, that yes. you said, what had that got to do with the Australian bishops? Pardon me? What, what had that last bit about the confession and the paedophile priest, what did that have to do with the bishops? Just a bit, just to Well, they, they were making both of those requests. Requests, that celibacy I see. be optional. I and that the confessors refuse yeah. absolution to yeah. pedophiles. I'm afraid I know nothing about um, this ah. story. I, I haven't heard anything about a group of Australian bishops going to the Pope with any requests. Mm. Um, if it's published in a local Canadian paper, it must be true. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and I, I feel like I've, I've been caught off guard. Look, but what I can address is the question of, of celibacy and, and mandatory celibacy. There is no question that Francis has made clear that in places of pastoral need, uh, the church should be willing to consider the ordination of viri probati, that's to say, married men of proven kind of, you know. But it would be, as I understand it, and there's been a lot written about this actually in Latin America, uh, it wouldn't be the same as an order, uh, rather, it would be ordination is ordination, but the faculties that were given with ordination would be different. It would be just for that community in that place. Now, this is going to be discussed in the Synod on the Amazon in 2019. And Francis has said to the Brazilian bishops who have made a specific request in this regard that they should come to him with concrete proposals. And I'm not quite sure then what the mechanism would be. I think that there is little doubt that in places like Chiapas in Mexico, in the Brazilian Amazon, where people literally see, they might see a priest once a year, uh, you know, there is a real uh, need for, for some kind of... Uh, uh, local priesthood, and I think it would be very interesting to see to see the effect of that. I don't think that um, celibacy, celibacy will remain the norm for the Catholic priesthood. I have no doubt about that. But I think in those pastoral situations, there's definitely a new openness to considering that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the whole thing, of pastoral conversion, um, with, with the Pope, you know, spelling out this on a constant basis. I guess when I think about how does this make its way down to the local church yeah. and become a reality, and I yeah. guess I I haven't, maybe I just missed it, but I haven't heard a lot of no. Francis um, talking about the role of the laity in this, and the, mm. you know, with the shortage of, of priests and all that sort of thing. I'm just curious if you have sort of yeah. some inside knowledge about No, it's that. a great question. I mean, the le the le he has actually said a lot about laity. And it's one of his um, obsessions almost is clericalism. See, clericalism is one of those things that makes the church distant. He sees that clericalism is a form of worldliness. Um, and, of course, in Evangelii Gaudium, there's a very strong emphasis on missionary discipleship, that we are all called to be missionary disciples. In fact, the church will never evangelize without uh, lay people uh, becoming missionary disciples. So that he sees clericalism as the enemy of that. Uh, and... Um, the formation of lay people. He's addressed this on, on a number of occasions, particularly actually for the Latin American bishops, because clericalism is a particular problem in, in, in Latin America. As for your question about how pastoral conversion translates into the local parish level, you know, I, 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 think, um, I think that Laudato Si uh, provides the basis for what we might call ev evangelization at a local level. I, I don't think this has really been spotted yet. But Laudato Si isn't just about ecology, it's about the whole environment within which we live. It's human ecology, social ecology, cultural ecology, how we relate to each other and how we relate to the environment. Everybody in our society feels deeply troubled by the way we now live. They feel governed by forces they can't control. They're upset by the despoliation of nature. They feel corporations have too much power. We have here a starting, uh, a conversation starter with almost anybody. You don't have to have any religious presupposition. I think then Laudato Si then offers an analysis of why that should be the case, the technocratic paradigm and so on, and calls us to actively restore a kind of lost connectedness in the way, in the little decisions we take in our daily lives. 
Well, that seems to me obvious that a parish, for a parish to embrace. Now, I know there are people here like Michael and indeed Christina who are passionate about the subject who would have much more to say than I do on this. But it just seems to me obvious that that's, uh, that's a clear route uh, for pastoral conversion of a parish. And the other one is Amoris Laetitia. When everybody stops arguing about chapter 8 and declaring the Pope a heretic, what they'll realize is that here we have a plan for the reinvigoration of marriage and family in the Western world. And it begins in a very practical way with a fantastic formation and catechesis. The way we prepare people for marriage, so I, I'm going to rant for a moment, is appalling. You know, we give them a three-hour talk and then we send them off into a society where, frankly, indissolubility is regarded as bizarre. And, you know, most of them don't make it. Why are we surprised? So in Amoris Laetitia, you have, if you're going to get married, you get buddied up with somebody who's been married for some years. You get a full course of preparation. We haven't even begun, I think, to absorb the implications of, of Amoris Laetitia. Uh, and while I'm on it, as a parish, get Evangelii Gaudium, read a chapter a week together in a group, and ask yourself the question throughout, what is the Pope asking of us as missionary disciples? And see what the Holy Spirit leads you to. There we are, three concrete suggestions. Thank you again for your uh, wonderful talk. But when I was more active in ministry than I am now, um, one of the dichotomies that I found extremely frustrating in parish life was that people were very comfortable with charity. Mm. That's, that's okay. Yeah, being nice to people is... Yeah. They were not comfortable with social justice. What are the things that have to be done to ensure that we don't need the charity? And somehow, that in my, you know, we tried very hard in the diocese I was working in, but I still see it as a dichotomy. Would you, I don't know what it's like in England, but what would your comments be on that? You see, I, I think this is, this is part of the problem that I was uh, seeking to define at the beginning of my talk. That in the rich world church, we, we're all falling out with each other over things like justice versus charity, being pro-life versus being pro-ecology. We're all, you know, we're, we're a polarized people. Something's gone wrong. These things should go together. And he said, in fact, to the Peruvian bishops, he said, uh, I'm giving a brief summary here, but no charity without evangelization, no charity without social justice, no social justice without denunciation of the conditions which prevent people flourishing. They all go together. You know, charity has to happen, will always happen, because people's concrete needs, you know, will always be there. They, they will differ enormously from place to place. Um, but the proclamation of the kingdom of God, of, of a different kind of world, has to go along with that. That's part of it. That's the proclamation. That's the evangelization. And you can't do that without at the same time saying what's wrong. You know? So, yeah, I mean, I think as far as Francis is concerned, these things all have to be brought together. It's not a question of doing one and not the other. That we have to do all of them together. But it's somehow a real challenge for our churches, isn't it? Uh, I, think, I think that that's why he's not liked. I mean, it's worldliness. Ultimately, it's worldliness. And I think, you know, it's like with Laudato Si. I mean, Benedict had a wonderful intuition, which was to engage the ecology movement in a conversation about why they believed in protecting the rainforest. And, and, and he's, Benedict said to them, look, if you care about the rainforest, why don't you care about the unborn child in the womb? And it was a wonderful, but it never really took off because, frankly, half of the Catholics of America were quite happy to trash the rainforest, you know, while going on pro-life marches. Francis has come along with integral ecology and said, if you believe in the unborn life in the womb, you need also to believe in the rainforest because it's part of the same logic of gift. We are given these things by God and in respecting the limits, our human limitations, that's morality, that's the basis of our morality. That's what I mean about the beginning of the whole conversation. We, you know, we need to understand that goodness is much bigger than we've made it. You know. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not sure that was a very good answer, but there we go. <laughs> Please. Uh, thank you. Um, 
I was uh, your your notion that the. Um, <clears throat> I've been talking about closeness, so I think I'm going to come. Yeah, yeah, no, please do. You, in in your talk, you talk about the notion of the, the that the church had become too much about idea, about ideology, and and that struck me as very well put because when I think of the, the conservative critics of Francis, say the um, the group that sort of hovers around first things in the United States, etc. Without naming any names, yeah. No, but <laughs> but they are very they are very ideologically driven. And I'm wondering, in, in your estimation, can, can Francis's uh, pontificate overcome that? Because it seems very entrenched, it's deep-seated, and, and it has a long tradition. So, so I'd just be interested in your um, estimation as to what might happen in the future, as, as the future well, unfolds. You know, I, I don't think Francis can do much about first things. Uh, it's extremely well financed by hedge fund millionaires. Who will presumably carry on funding it as they do all these traditionalist institutes? You know, America's special, right? You know, uh, and but what he what he can do is to challenge it, and he can say, you know, the gospel is this. That's his job as pope, and their vicious reaction demonstrates that he's got a point. Look, you know, challenging worldliness is not new. It's the job of a pope, and early in John Paul II's pontificate, he challenged another kind of ideology and another kind of worldliness which was a Marxist liberation theology and so on. You know, he was right to challenge that. I don't think John Paul was always right in the way he went about it and so on, but he was right to challenge that. Francis is right to challenge another kind of worldliness which you know, worships the free market as an idol. Uh, that's an ideology. The same ideology which um, you know, says uh, abortion and same-sex marriage are non-negotiables, but hey, death penalty, that's a prudential judgment, and, or nuclear weapons, yeah, that's okay because... No, you can't do that anymore. That's why we mean about integral morality. So I, th I, think, I think, in a sense, he's doing what every pope should do, which is to challenge any attempt to truncate and reduce the gospel, and particularly to resist any, uh, any attempt to place the gospel in the service of political and ideological interests, which is clearly what's gone on in America. And I think the way he's reshaping the American hierarchy uh, and documents like Laudato Si, I think are deeply unsettling for the American right. They really, really don't like him. Uh, and that's becoming obvious. And I, therefore, I'd say he's probably doing his job. Um, I'd like to suggest that it's not only the Chilean church that's um, very disturbed by Francis' reaction to Bishop Barron. Any... Um, insights, any understanding sure. that you can give us on that would be much appreciated. Uh, it's Bishop Barros, by the way, not, not Bishop Barron, who's the uh, auxiliary bishop of Los Angeles and a well-known evangelist. Uh, but yeah, I know, I know a lot about this because I know Chile well, and I was there in 2015. Um, it's hard to give a quick answer on this. We were talking about it over supper. I, I actually think Francis is right to defend the innocence of Bishop Barros because I think the, the evidence against him uh, isn't good. And I also think Barros has been scapegoated from within the Chilean church uh, by, the, by the other bishops. He's looked at the case in depth and he's reached the conclusion. And I've met Bishop Barros myself as well as one of the other bishops accused. Uh, and I have no reason to doubt that the Pope is wrong in this, uh, that Barros is basically innocent. Not innocent of everything, but innocent of what he's accused of. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's not something on which Francis can win because he defends Bishop Barris' innocence, and he's accused, therefore, of not acting against, uh, you know, he's accused of being part of the cover-up on abuse. Uh, he's, not, he's never going to win, but I actually think he was right to do it, and he paid a very heavy price in Chile. I mean, it dominated the whole trip. Now, he was wrong to use the word calumny. He apologized for it on the plane, but he didn't retract his view, <laughs> which is that the accusations are false. I think the problem with the word calumny is it implies the victims are actually consciously lying, which is problematic, and he apologized for that. Um, but I think he's right to defend him. You know, I think the gospel demands that you defend the innocent. See, a lot of people in Chile take a very different view. They say, we don't care whether he's innocent or not. We don't want all this Karadima stu stuff to stick to the church. Therefore, he should resign. He should go away. He should. That's the scapegoat mechanism, you know. We have to live differently. If, 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 if the gospel teaches us to live differently. Do you want to come back? Really, two follow-up questions. The first, um, 
when you say the evidence is weak, uh, is there any way to understand that than to say that the accusers are lying? That's the first follow-up question. And the second is, is there not a sense in which, even though Barris is innocent, so let's make that as an assumption, the fact that he is rejected is more than enough reason to move him on? Um, I think that's the logic of Caiaphas, if you'll forgive me. It's the, it's the logic of Caiaphas. It's a bit... It, Sorry, but it's better that one man die, even though he's innocent for the sake of the nation. So, sorry, but I mean, that, do you know what I mean? I think, I think that's the thing about the scapegoat mechanism is you know, where you have to choose either to go along with it or you have to choose to stand out against it. I think Francis has no choice but to stand out against it, even though the, the, there might be a heavy pastoral price to pay. I think on the wider question of abuse, though, I, I, I reject the narrative which has appeared in the media in the last week, which is that Francis has a blind spot on abuse. I don't accept that. But he's certainly not as aware, or he wasn't as aware in 2013, as somebody like Cardinal O'Malley, who's really lived with this situation. There's no question that no Latin American bishop has the same awareness that, say, an American bishop would have on this issue. But I think he's learned pretty fast. I think he's done an awful lot. And we, I don't want to bore you with it. You know, I, can, I can detail the steps and the initiatives and the Pontifical Council and all the rest of it. But one thing I think I can tell you is that he's very, very serious about not only stamping out abuse, but also on not tolerating any cover-up or any failure to deal with pedophile priests. He's, the determination is absolutely clear on that. But there's still a huge way to go in the Vatican in terms of transparent and proper procedures, particularly in the CDF. I just wanted to pick up on... I was going to ask... Sure, I was expecting similar. it, don't worry. <laughs> um, I guess my pushback would be is that a lot of lay people in particular know very well uh, scapegoating by the church. Yeah, absolutely. That it's a regular occurrence that to avoid scandal, it's better for the good of the community that you step aside absolutely. or withdraw or whatnot. Absolutely. And you talked, uh, or and Francis has talked about the wounded church, the field hospital or whatnot. What about, what would stand in the way of bishops, including Francis, mm. and their understanding of a wounded episcopacy. Mm. Uh, what would what what's, would stand in the way of them embracing this notion of a wounded episcopacy? Then, well, okay. So, so I mean, you rightly identify the cause of this whole problem, which is clericalism, the desire to protect the institution, the failure to listen to the victim. I mean, but this pope is the one who. So it clearly goes after Absolutely. clericalism. Yeah, and he does. And but, he does. But and, and, and listen, in Santiago, right, he gave the bishops the most astonishing address on clericalism. You know, he said, lay people are not peons. They're not there like parrots to repeat what you say. I mean, he went, in Chile, he went to the cause of the Karadima crisis, which is precisely authoritarianism, clericalism, and all the rest of it. He, 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 na he nailed that. And in fact, he said very clearly, it worries me when the church is preoccupied by its image, by the desire to conserve its reputation. He nailed the cause of the clerical sex abuse crisis. Mm. Look, the fact that the church lost credibility because of its deep failures to, on this issue doesn't then make it right to repeat that or to endorse that same mechanism when a but, bishop but is But why victim. would he, what was the need for him to be appointed that bishop? I mean, he was already a bishop. He was already a bishop. Thank you for pointing that out, because a lot of people so don't realize that. So was he the only bishop in town no, that could he have wasn't. gone to that, knowing, no, knowing but, this history in that country? Uh, no, but he was a bishop. He was the bishop of the armed forces. Right. He had to move on. He'd been there for 10 years. If the Pope didn't give him a diocese, he would have been punishing him. What would he have been punishing? I mean, is that really... Yes, bishops run dioceses. That's their job. No, no, but I mean this notion of appearing of being punished. Is, is that the... Yeah. Sorry. Is that worth... Canonically, a bishop who is a bishop, if, you don't, if, a, if he's not named to a diocese, it must be because he's done something wrong. That's bishops run dioceses. <laughs> That's what they do, right? Right. So they're ordinaries. They're, they're successors of the apostles. For, for, you, for, you, for a pope to say to a bishop okay, you're now due for a diocese, but guess what? I'd like you to go and be a, I don't know, a prison chaplain. That would be a, a canonical punishment. Wow. That, and the Congregation for Bishops, by the way, made very clear. They looked at it all and they said there is no obstacle to his appointment. But he wouldn't be the first. I mean, there's a long list of 
What, bishops were being parked somewhere, you mean? Yeah, or promoted up to the Vatican. I mean, uh, yeah, no, we've had enough of that, thank you very much. <laughs> I just, it just doesn't sound like a very, considering the context in, in, in which so much that Francis says, I can't help but feel that. Okay, okay. And I love the guy. Don't no, no, no. I, okay, what I'm trying to... There's a blind what, spot. No, no. Which what I I'm, know you what, reject. No, what I'm trying to persuade you of is he's acting with utter consistency and the guy has cojones to do it. That's my point. Because he's paid a heavy price because everybody takes... You know, it would be far easier for him to say, yeah, 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 this guy. No, no, no. Because he is innocent and he's convicted, he's convinced of his innocence, he named him to Osorno. And interestingly, last week, when Barros appeared at the first mass, the other bishops initially just, you know, when the media went to interview Barros, they all scarpered, you know, he's left on his own. But actually by the end, because the Pope had spoken to them, they, would, they were physically defending him and even on camera. Yeah, the bishops took ownership, you know, they, there was a conversion there. Now, of course, the media narrative, and as far as the victims is concerned, is, ah, this is the church closing ranks and all that stuff. Okay, they're going to see it that way. So I, he's never going to win on this. But I think he's done the right thing. Thank you very much. That was excellent. I have many non-believing friends who love Francis. I have many Protestant friends who love Francis. They call him, he's our Pope too. Yeah. And then there's my Catholic friends. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I find it very disturbing, in fact, that many of them are critical, suspicious. They just can't say a good word about him. How do you personally engage with that level of criticism among, among your own? Yeah. I mean, normally when I'm engaging with, um, you know, with conservative critics of Francis, I always try to understand why, you know, look, you know as with any dialogue, you, know, you try and understand, first of all, actually not what uh, discomforts them about Francis, um, because I think actually a lot about Francis is deeply disconcerting. He's a man open to the Holy Spirit and therefore very challenging and disconcerting. What I want to get from my conservative critics is what is it that you value that you believe is being undermined by this papacy? What do you think is being lost? Where, where's the threat? And normally, you know, you get a narrative that goes more or less like this. Well, after the Second Vatican Council, there was complete chaos and everybody, nobody knew what a, being a Catholic was. This Polish Pope came and he told us what meant being a Catholic was, restored our sense of confidence and identity. We knew what a Catholic was then, and this guy seems to be unraveling it. In other words, um, the hermeneutic, if I can use that technical word, the lens through which they're viewing this, you know, it is one actually shaped by their experience or their trauma or their traumatic experience in the past. And I think it's important to name that. I think it's important to say, well, do you think maybe you know, you're seeing this guy who, after all, has come out of Latin America in a very different context. Do you think you're applying a lens that isn't appropriate? I would invite them to see, to, to see a, the, and a, you know, a lot of also the critics of the Pope I've noticed are, uh, unlike the gentleman, who spoke, the gentleman who spoke earlier who, you know, loves Francis, who was a, a minister for 30 years, many of the critics are converts, actually, and or reverts. In other words, people who have been traumatized by relativism, by liquidity, by individualism. And they end up projecting onto the Catholic Church something that the church actually isn't. The church isn't outside time, you know, like a rock floating through space. The church is actually engaged with history and is constantly organically developing, right? Uh, and, and many of the traditionalists just don't see it that way. So again, I think their lens has determined the way they see Francis. I read an article for Crux uh, last year called Francis's Convert Problem, where I talked about convert neurosis. <laughs> And I named a number of people who I thought embodied that. And I had to apologize because they all got very offended. Uh, you know, paper biographer accuses critics of being mentally ill. It was, one, it was the life site news headline. Uh, but actually, I, you know, a lot of, interestingly, a lot of the convert critics, of, not but a lot of converts, they said, yeah, he's right. You know, actually, you know, we didn't, when we first came out, became Catholic, we didn't really understand what the church was. And we, it's taken us time to realize that. Um, so, yeah, I think it's about understanding the lens with which he's being viewed. Does that help? And, and engage in a dialogue and understand that they value something. This, by the way, is a big lesson from my sort of apologetic, with my apologetics hat in engaging with humanists and secularists and critics of the church. What is the value that they, that they really believe in that they think is in some way threatened? That, if once you identify that, you'll realize that that value is probably very similar to a value that you hold. And once you've realized that, you can have a very interesting conversation. You're no longer threatened by each other. 
I was wondering if you could help us with another value that we're struggling with locally. I'm trying to take the principles that you've been talking about and apply them to a problem. We have the new legislation in Canada on euthanasia. I'm sure you know about it. So I'm trying to think about how do we communicate um, ideas to a secular society. And you said that the church has become too idea focused. So we should abandon ideas, go out. But Francis has told us to go out and go out into the dark uh, with the light and follow that person, be with that person. How do we speak to, how do we communicate about this matter to a secular society who is telling passionate stories which carry a, a great deal of um, urge to mercy um, without using ideas yeah. when you're in the dark beside them, beside yeah. the bed, and they tell you that what you're offering is not enough? Yeah. I hope nobody's taken away from tonight the fact that I'm in any way against ideas or truth or doctrine. Absolutely not. It's just, all, my only point was it's not enough. And actually the euthanasia argument is a really good example. If you start out as a Catholic saying euthanasia is wrong, it's just morally wrong, you know, life is sacred, blah, blah, blah. You, set, you, you assert a moral proposition to which the answer comes back, well, I don't actually share your worldview. Here's somebody who's suffering and therefore why not? So, you, you know, you, you, it's the wrong place to start. With the euthanasia, by the way, there's this book I've written called How to Defend the Faith Without Raising Your Voice. I have a whole chapter on euthanasia because it's, or assisted suicide because it's a key area now. Uh, uh, and, and, and the point I go in there with there is that we have to get away from the idea that suffering, that, which a lot of people believe about Christianity, that we think in some way suffering is good. Actually, we're not afraid of suffering, but unnecessary suffering is wrong. So the kind of suffering which leads somebody to want assisted suicide is the, is the suffering often of extreme pain, but more importantly of existential loneliness and depression and so on. That's what we need to address, uh, you know, rather than, uh, and, then, and, then, and then I move on to in the, in the chapter to actually talk about the hospice movement, where that came from, which is actually a movement of mercy, right? Responding to precisely what leads people to want to assist in suicide. And, and then the last stage of the argument is to say what happens to a society when you do legalize assisted suicide and how that leaves the vulnerable. That's, that's basically uh, the way Actually, the what we're finding is something quite uh, surprising, that um, it's not enough to control physical pain. The loneliness, like suffering really is not completely eradicable yeah. uh, because it's so complex. That's right. But the physical things we can do, we can prevent prolongation of death, we can do a lot of things like that, but yeah. that is not sufficient for the rational, secular no. uh, person who wants control, who does not want incontinence, who doesn't want gradual decline, who wants um, a moment of death with, with family and friends around them, who wants they to want, orchestrate they want to it, who, wants, they go. who yeah. wants to play the Ave Maria, if anyone heard the white coat black art. Um, last weekend, wants to play the Ave Maria in the background um, and to be sensible at the moment of their death, not to, uh, not to become delirious. Death is um, unfortunately messy yeah. and it's not appreciated by our society. So we're finding that the requests are actually much, much more common than we imagine right. and most of them are from highly educated people who are receiving excellent hospice care. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're now at the level of, you're asking me questions about uh, the campaign here and how to, it's too much detail. I, you know, I, I've lived through the same thing in England. I think we're going to end up with assisted suicide law in Britain. So far we haven't had it, but we, I think we probably will have. I fought the good fight on same-sex marriage. I argued against that very strongly, but it was obvious from the very beginning there was no way we were going to win that one. I think assisted suicide is still winnable to, to a much greater extent. But I think actually this illustrates a little bit of what I was talking about at the beginning of the talk. You know, this stuff is being swept away. Nobody really understands. In it, with an individualist, secularist, you know, mentality, it's very hard to have a converse, even a conversation about the ethics of something like an assisted suicide law. Yeah. Well, and that's what you must never do. But what you can do 
is to focus on, well, I think you almost said it yourself, you know, it's the witness. And I think that's why I say hospices. We need to tell the story of hospices. We need to tell how they came about, what they do. What happens in countries which have euthanasia laws like Holland and Belgium, where there basically aren't hospices? You know, that's the story we need to tell. And we're not very good at it, actually. We need to tell that story. Thank you for the question. Oh, you're working me hard tonight. <clears throat> Thank you. First of all, uh, I'm most gratified to be here tonight uh, to listen to the uh, very powerful presentation. Thank you. Uh, and in a way, it's very uh, touching. Uh, I know the night is late and it's cold outside. We all want to go home to our warm home. So my question is very brief. As uh, keen observer of the Vatican, uh, you must know that uh, the post message, as you so eloquently presented here tonight, uh, touches on, as you mentioned, the traditional Catholic uh, proclamation of uh, faith, uh, at the same time combined with the message of God's love mercy and charity. Uh, I wonder in your experience, uh, or in what sense do you have uh, in regard to the receptiveness or the, uh, the reaction of the Catholic Church, the Universal Catholic Church, uh, through its agents, you know, the professional clergymen, uh, and all the bishops and archbishops, how do they receive uh, the, uh, the post message? Because Sundays after Sundays, they sort of, you know, stand up there in the pulpit, preach a message, supposedly the post message. Mm. But we haven't seen any proclamation from the Council of Bishops uh, here in Canada, in UK, in Germany, and in, in and down south mm. of our the borders, mm. uh, this is all in light of, say, the refugee problems in mm. Germany, yeah. uh, the the U.S. you know uh, uh, dreamless problems, and here in Quebec, and we have a lot of people coming up from the states uh, to ask for refugee status here, so. What sense do you have of the Catholic Church leaders in terms of their receptiveness, receptiveness to the yeah. uh, well, post message? I, I, I can answer that. Thank very, you. I'm I, sorry. Don't worry. Don't worry. I can answer that very briefly by saying it's a mixed bag. <laughs> you know, look, reception reception of papal teaching is a process. It's not. It does. You know unlike what people think about the Catholic Church. It is not a global corporation with a headquarters where the orders come down, everybody goes, yes, sir, that's just not the way it is. And, you know, you can see over Morris Letizia, the pushback is very heavy in, from some quarters. Uh, I think Laudato Si is being widely ignored. I don't think the U.S. bishops, for example, have said almost anything on the ecology question since Laudato Si came out. Should we be bothered by this? Should we be disturbed by this? Well, just remember, just to take Laudato Si, Rerum Navarre, 1891, Leo XIII said there was such a thing as a just wage, and half of the Catholic businessmen of Europe said he was mad or Marxist, right? So it took about 20 years for Catholics to, to begin to embrace the idea of the morality of these things. And I think it's the same with ecology. You know, the morality of ecology will be normal in the future. We will all have an ecological conversion, but it's going to take time. It'll probably take a generation. And as for the wider message of the Pope on pastoral conversion, you know, this is not an easy process. You know, I think what I tried to communicate tonight was this is a real conversion. It's about depending on Christ, not on ourselves. And that's the, journey, the biggest journey any of us can ever make in our own lives. And we know how hard it is in our own lives to let go and to trust in the Holy Spirit and put Christ at the center. And if that's difficult in our own lives, how hard is it as an institution? So it's a process. I think, though, that Francis has initiated that process in a way that's so strong, so imaginative, so creative, that I think we're going to be 
this is the beginning. This papacy is the beginning of a new era in the church, a global servant's church, uh, which has pastoral conversion and the pastorality of the Second Vatican Council at its heart. Because actually, frankly, the rich world church lost you know, the fire of the council. In Latin America, they kept it. And I think that's what we're seeing here now. Is we're seeing a reinvigoration of the church actually from the council. But just as the council was enormously resisted at the time, this is being resisted. And it's, it's the dynamic tension within the Catholic Church, which in a way is part of the life of the institution. We're, you know, we, we, we're going to carry on arguing about this stuff for a long time. But I am confident that this is the beginning of a series of pontificates that, as it were, uh, opens up this new era. We're not going back. And that Francis will be seen as the, as the beginning, beginning of the one who initiated a process which in subsequent pontificates we'll see fulfilled to a much greater extent. Thank you. My question was actually going to be about Vatican II, and just, um, I don't know if you can say a little bit more about your sense of, among the bishops, um, how deliberate is that dialogue? Like, are... At what level are those conversations going on of um, this sense of, you know, this fire keeping, you know, kind of erupting now? Yeah. Is, is that really what's happening? Yeah. Well, I think, I think what you're seeing with, uh, in this pontificate is an attempt to embed the conversion to which the council called us, uh, to embed it in the structures of the church. So two key words here, I'm sorry about the technical words, collegiality and synodality. Collegiality is the participation of the local church in the decisions taken by the universal church. And synodality is a kind of dark culture of dialogue within the church. Now, he's been very strong on both of those things. In the Synod of Bishops, the Reformed Synod, are, 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 are in the family synods of 2014 and 15, you had, for the first time since the council, a genuine mechanism of ecclesial discernment, which was willing to live, as the council invited us to do, in the tension between truth and and mercy, the universal and the particular. To live in the tension, and it's very painful, but from that tension emerges then the creative synthesis, right? Now, I think that's now, that reformed synod, that's the future. All synods are going to be like that from now on, you know? So I think it's the dynamic of the council that Francis is, is bringing it right into the heart of the church and into the structures of the church. And there will continue to be bishops who are deeply uncomfortable with it, who just pine to go back to the age when they could just give orders and everybody would hopefully obey, uh, and, and that these questions were settled. But no, we have now a dyna much more dynamic church, precisely because we've embedded the council in a way that I think we hadn't before. And it's going to be much more tense, but much more dynamic, because it's much more open to the Holy Spirit, and therefore much more disconcerting but much more real. It's actually about following Christ rather than our own designs. Uh, and so I think it's taken a Latin American pope <laughs> to do that. I, I think it was necessary for it to be somebody from Latin America uh, who could, because I think the fire had in many ways, has in many ways gone out in our churches. So we are now being re-evangelized from the periphery, just as happened in the Gospels where the light is lit, you know, from, from Bethlehem and Galilee. The center always resists, right? but you bring the center into contact with the periphery and you create that dynamism and that tension, which is what, which is, what is so creative. So personally, I feel, very, I feel very positive and very optimistic that we are moving on from a strategy of resistance, as it were, to one that will lead in the future to a genuine renaissance, pastoral renaissance. Okay, I'll have a seat. I would like to invite forward Dr. Kieran Bonner. He's a professor in our sociology and legal studies department to say thank you on our behalf. Thank you, Christina. I'm delighted here to be able to uh, thank Dr. Ivory uh, here at this Higgins lecture. I was uh, um, Michael's vice president and dean when he was president here. Uh, I learned a lot about the Catholic intellectual tradition working with Michael and uh, have become part of that Catholic intellectual tradition. 
And as we remember what we're talking about with Dr. Ivory's talk, that we're talking about the, secularly speaking, the oldest institution in Western culture. And if you think of this oldest institution in Western culture, over 2,000 years old, and just in our lifetime, we think of Pope John the 23rd, Pope uh, John Paul I, Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict, and now Pope Francis. And think of the changes they are bringing in this institution. Within the institution, it's a demonstration how alive this institution is. Uh, I'd like to, uh, it's also an institution that is willing to tackle mysteries. Uh, this is the Higgins talk. Uh, it's been said of Dr. Michael Higgins that he eats shredded thesaurus for breakfast. <laughs> and we have another mystery. How have we managed to keep Michael quiet for two, for two hours? I, th I think it's very appropriate that Dr. Ivory is here to speak uh, at the Higgins lecture. And that uh, as he was speaking, I was thinking of a recent phrase with regard to the whole uh, Trump. Uh, there's a, there was a cartoon, George Washington, I cannot tell a lie. Nixon, I cannot tell the truth. <laughs> Trump, I cannot tell the difference. <laughs> We, we think of all the division, both Brexit, and I'm very familiar with Brexit being Irish and following it very closely, and also um, with Trump. And think of the good news that Francis is bringing. Think of the good news and the news that makes us feel good, as we all talk about this. And that's part of our institution. Uh, and that he as, uh, is an example of what one of my favorite uh, philosophers and theorists would say, the example of how the human can begin something new. For Hannah Arendt, Jesus was the example of beginning something new of action, that it can be a renewing of the world. Here we have Francis renewing the world. And uh, I'd like to uh, see in that renewal, we can become more at home in the world. Uh, I uh, want to thank Dr. Ivory for bringing that message, which is both, as he said at the end, ideas and action of hope, welcome, and love. Uh, into our lives. Thank you for being a messenger. Thank you, Kieran. Just a couple of announcements before we finish up for the evening. We send out regular emails about upcoming speakers. So if you're not currently on our mailing list and you do want to receive information about these lectures in Catholic experience, as well as other lectures and events taking place at St. Jerome's this year, please feel free to sign up uh, at the welcome table in the atrium. I want to sincerely thank all the people who have contributed to the fund that supports this Higgin Lectures on Religion and the Media. And again, I also want to thank uh, Michael and Christina for being able to be with us this evening. It's been wonderful to have them here this all day, well, since about 5.30. Every year, St. Jerome's University is pleased to be able to present a program of speakers to the community, and we're able to make them available free of charge because of the generosity of so many partners and supporters. If you, too, would like to support the lectures, there are donation envelopes available at the welcome table. And when you're in the atrium, you can visit the table where there are a number of fairly traded products available for sale by our Social Justice Committee. And beside them, our local independent bookseller, Wordsworth Books, is also with us this evening. Please make sure to visit their table. And they have uh, uh, Dr. two of Dr. Ivory's books with them for purchase. And he is uh, willing to meet you and sign those books. Okay? So some upcoming events. The next lecture in Catholic Experience will take place on Friday, March the 16th. So please note that this is a change in date from what we originally advertised, and that change is because of the change in the um, schedule of the speaker himself. Architect and human rights advocate Douglas Cardinal will be here to present the Lawrence Cummings Lecture on Cultural History, entitled Organic Architecture and the Indigenous Worldview. The Indigenous Worldview, he says, stands in contrast 
to the colonial worldview built on hierarchical systems of power and control. So on that evening, Mr. Cardinal will talk about how this indigenous worldview informs both his architectural and political work in human rights. The next Bridges Lecture will take place next Wednesday, January 31st at 7.30 p.m. here in Vanstone. And it is entitled, Polar Projections, Conceptualizing and Rendering Arctic Spaces. Professors Ruxanda Moraru and Whitney Lachenbauer will discuss how humans have measured, defined, and characterized space and time, and how mathematics continues to explain what is possible and what is not. On Saturday, February the 3rd, Gabriel Earnshaw will be presenting a rendition of Henry Nouwen's letters along with some musical accompaniment. This event is taking place at Holy Rosary Church in Guelph, starting at 7.30 p.m. The event is entitled Love Henry, which is how he used to sign his letters, Letters on the Spiritual Life. And the event is co-sponsored by the Henry Nouwen Society, Ignatius Jesuit Center, and Holy Rosary Church. And there is some information about that event at the welcome table as well. So finally, I just want to thank all of you for coming this evening. Good to have you with us as always. Thank you for whatever you do to help to spread the word about our lectures and events. I look forward to seeing you at this lecture series in March. So for this evening, safe trip home and good night. <laughs>